God has given us, we talked about um, um, our culture earlier, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more. But, but in this year, in this year of unbelievable, God started, started us off with a series called It's Bigger Than Me, that it's bigger than me. And God was giving us direction and even instruction and in trying to adjust our perspective on what it is and how it is that we are to act and even think while we're executing the, the will of the Father in the kingdom, that we had to know that everything that we encounter, that it's not just about us, that the blessing that you're looking for is not just about you, that, that the breakthrough that you've been praying for, that it's bigger than you, that what God wants to do in your family, that it's bigger than you, that even this unbelievable season that we are praying for and expecting, you are going to be a benefit and a beneficiary of what it is that God is doing, but it is bigger than you. So touch the person next to you and say, it's bigger than me. And so after that, we went into our series called Unbelievable, and God was getting our faith to rise. And then after that, we went into a series called House Rules. And out of House Rules, God brought us into this series called Concrete. And what it was is that God has been saying that, hey, that we're growing fast, we're doing a lot of things, that, 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 that I'm accelerating the ministry, that I'm, that I'm expanding people's hearts. But one of the things that God told us in the very beginning, well before we ever started about this church, he said, build it strong before you build it fast. Yeah. And if I could just tell you that's a word for a lot of our lives, that we should need to build things strong before we build it fast. Because if you build it fast, you'll over end up, you're, you're end up overextending yourself and that thing can crumble. And so what God said is that we need to set a solid foundation, a firm foundation, that it got to be concrete. That the culture of the organization, the culture of the church, that it has to be stable. That the culture um, and the core values of the church, that it has to be solidified. It has to be cemented. It has to be something that can change people. And so God gave us 10 core values. We've walked through them, love, authenticity. We've talked, uh, walked through connection. We've talked through growth. And today, we're going to go into another one, and it's one of my favorites uh, because I believe it's, 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 it's one of the things that God has placed on my heart, um, and it is vision. Somebody say vision. And so we're going to go to Proverbs 29 into the 18th verse. This is going to be our anchor verse for the, today. And we'll have a few, move, uh, few more verses as we go into it. When you're there, say I'm there. Yeah. On the screen, I got it. <laughs> so listen, this is what it says. Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says, When there is no vision. My God. Another translation says where. Where. So we're, we're dealing with the context of where and when in a specific place where there is no vision and at a specific time when there is no vision. The Bible says this, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I want to focus on that first one. Let me read that one more time. It says when, 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 when there is no vision. Another translation said when there's no revelation. When there's no vision. The people perish. Father, I pray that for these next few moments um, that you would speak through me. I pray that they wouldn't hear me, but they would hear you. I pray that they wouldn't see me, but they would see you. God, I pray that you would open up our hearts. Allow us to receive a word from you that will change us forever. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. amen. So listen, uh, vision is a, critical, it is a critical element in everybody's lives, and especially in the life of the believer. It's important to know that although that this is our second to last value that we're going through, that it is one of the most important values that we could ever have. So we've been in this series of concrete like I talked about, um, and we've discussed how culture, that it will protect you, right? We talked about how culture, it can direct you, how culture can build. Vision is the exact same way. Vision is very similar. Proper vision, that it will guide you. Proper vision, that it will direct you onto the path, um, that God has called you to is very similar like this. Like I talked about in the beginning that we have a very simple and clear vision here at Blueprint. And it says that we are here to create a place where people can belong, to help them become who God has called them to be, and then to build a big life. So those things right here, that is our vision. What does that mean that that directs us? And I will tell you this, that the vision of your life will end up creating the culture of your life. That they have to go hand in hand. Let me show you why, why I say that. So we have 10 core values here, right, Jay Cook? And the thing is we talk about if we were to, uh, to deduce our uh, extended vision into three simple words, which is our slogan, B3, into belong, become, build. Every one of our core values, it has to fit inside of that slogan. So if you think about this, a place where we talk about belong. In order to create a place where you belong, you have to have love. 
in order to create a place where people know that they belong, that there has to be connection. And we talk about becoming, becoming who God has called you to be. It is impossible for you to become God who God has called you to be if you are not moving in authenticity. It is impossible if there is not growth. If, as we continue to move down, it's impossible for us to build the kingdom, for us to build big lives, for us to build our community and our church if we don't have generosity, if we don't have a growth mindset. If we're not focused on the next generation, your vision matters. The vision of your marriage that's one of the things I love. One of, one of my greatest joys of being a, a senior pastor is the ability to do premarital counseling. And one of the things that I always tell every couple that we go through is that you should have a vision for your marriage. That there should be a vision for your marriage. That you should know what are, what are we looking, looking for? Where are we looking to head? If you look at some of, these, some of these marriages, like I talked about Carrie's parents, and they've been married for 35 years. They have a vision for their marriage. We're trying to get somewhere. And where it is that you're trying to go is going to determine the culture that you have to create. So hear me on this, that in a place where we know that we're creating vision or that we're creating culture is that it has to derive from our vision. Your vision will give you a strategy. It will give you a methodology. Hear me on this, because if you don't have vision, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you'll never know when you get there. <laughs> if you, even Abraham, if we were to go back to the book of Genesis, God spoke to him and said, hey, Abram. He was Abram at this time. He said, I need you to leave your father's house, throw away the idols, and I need you to go to a place called there. Now, Abram had no idea what this place looked like. He had no, no idea where this place actually was. He said, you'll know when you get there because I, you may not know what the process likes, but you know where you're headed. It is important and critical to have a vision. So we go to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, and we see a, we see a, a parable here. We see an instruction from a man named Solomon. Somebody say Solomon. So it says, when there is no vision, the people perish. To give you context on, who they, on, on what this is, Solomon, if, who, who of us here know, know King David? We know David, David and Goliath, right? So David ended up marrying a woman, and, when he, and uh, he married multiple women, but one of the women he married, it ain't that, that, we can't do that no more, y'all. Relax. But, but, he, but he ended up marrying a woman, and he births a son named Solomon. And Solomon was a wild boy. Solomon grew up and he ended up becoming king. Solomon had over a thousand wives and concubines combined. And one of the things is, is that Solomon lived a life that, that was dichotomous, is that sometimes he was living for the Lord and sometimes because of these thousand wives and, and they worshiped idols and all these things that he ended up getting pulled into some of the lifestyles and some of the practices as they did. That's why you have to be, uh, be careful who you marry, but that's not for today. Um, but the thing is, is this, is that Solomon ended up at the end of his life writing what we know as the Proverbs. And what happens is that one of these days, um, God came to Solomon in a vision and said, hey, I'll give you anything that you want. Ty, he said, anything. Anything that you want, let me know and I'll give it to you. He said, God, give me wisdom to lead your people. And God said, because you asked for this and you didn't ask for wealth or you didn't ask for power, not only am I going to make you the wisest man to ever live, but I'll also make you the wealthiest man to ever live. Which also lets us know that if you have wisdom, you can produce wealth. Yeah. But he says this, and so Solomon begins to write these parables. And when we get to this, where there is no vision, the people perish. Solomon was writing this from, from, a, from a vantage point in front of perspective. Is that I've led people many times and for many years. I've been in situations, and I've been in leadership for a long time. And what I can tell you here, JC, is that if you don't have vision, the people will perish. If you don't know where you're going then things will get really, really bad. Things will get murky. That if you don't have a vision for your life, if you don't have a vision, then the people will perish. And this is the thing, if I can, you allow me just to, to nerd out for a little bit. A lot of times, Terry, when we read this, we understand the word perish as die. When we think about perish, we, we, we think that, that it means to die or that some, somebody was killed. But if I could tell you this, that the Hebrew meaning of perish does not mean die. It is the Hebrew word para. Somebody say para. It's para, and listen to what it means. It means to make run crazy, to allow to run wild, or to leave unattended. Yeah. It, it, it says to make run crazy, to allow to run wild, or to leave unattended. So what he's saying is that where there is no vision in whatever place that you leave without vision, that you're leaving it unattended. So if you don't have a vision for your marriage, you're leaving your marriage unattended. If you don't have a vision for your organization, you're leaving your organiza organization unattended. If you don't have a vision for your finances, you're leaving it unattended. That's why you look up and you don't know where you spent your money. That, that's why you look into your marriage and you say, man, I don't know how we got here. 
You don't have a vision for your friendships. That's why you start befriending people that you know you shouldn't be in friendship with. That's how you create, the, that's how you create these trauma bonds. Only friends with them because you gossip about the same things. Ooh-wee. We're bonding over what it is that breaks us instead of where it is they're trying to go. Do you have a vision for your life? Do you have a vision for where it is you're trying to head? Do you have a vision for your business? If you don't, what we're seeing, as Solomon says, is that you're leaving it unattended. And wherever you leave something unattended, you leave the opportunity for thieves, thieves to come in. Anything that you leave unattended, you give the opportunity or the enemy the opportunity to creep in and steal. Anything that you leave unattended, it's bad stewardship. Leaving our minds unattended. Leaving our hearts unattended. Leaving our churches unattended. Where there's no vision, the people will perish. Where there is not a directive, hear me on this, where we are not in our lives, if we don't have a vision for it. Think about this. It's almost like when you walk into a bank, there's security everywhere because you understand that there's something valuable in this place that we need to guard. If you don't have a vision in any area, you are leaving that place unguarded. Think about your life. How often have you left your thoughts unguarded? How often have you left your relationships, your relationship with God, unguarded? Attacks come and pull us out. So hear me on this, that God cares about our vision. But this is the thing what I want you to understand is that there is a duality to discuss or to attack when we're discussing vision. Because I'm talking about having a vision, which is where you're headed or what you're trying to accomplish or what God has set you out on. But you also have vision, which is your ability to see. So you have a vision, which is where you're headed, and you have vision, which is your ability to see. And hear me on this. If you do not have clear vision, you can never create a godly vision. If you cannot see correctly, there's no way that you'll be able to interpret correctly. That the vision for your life is critical. Do you know that the most frequent miracle that is listed in the New Testament for Jesus' ministry is the healing of the blind? That we see that in multiple ways... Jesus walked through. Now we hear about him healing the sick and raising the dead. But the ones that are recorded in specific details, the most frequent one, Ali, is the healing of the blind. Now it made me sit back and wonder and say, God, what, what does that mean? But we have to pay attention to frequencies in the Bible. I talk about this, that we don't have to be theologians, but we do need to make sure that we have an understanding and comprehension of the Bible. And one thing that we have to recognize is patterns. And if God is consistently letting us know that he has, a, has, has authority over blindness, then that's letting us know that he has an idea and he has a goal and he has a vision for our vision. That God just doesn't only care that you see, but he cares how you see. And not only in the, in, in the healing of the blind, that through multiple times that he healed in different ways. And one, for one person, he spoke to him. For another person, he touched them. For one, he spit in mud. For another one, that he actually spit in their eyes. For another one, he told them to go wash in the pool. And he showed us many different methods because he also understands if he did it through one way too many times that you would worship the method and not the man. That, that, that he could not put too much emphasis on the same thing because like we do, we worship traditions. It's very easy. No, 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 no. This is how God does it. No, that's how you experienced it. And he's showing, I have authority over blindness. It is not the pool of Siloam. It is not the clay in itself. It is not the area. It is the God. That God has authority over blindness. And so, condi- so continually, we see this frequency. We see this frequency. You have to pay attention to when frequencies come up. It's kind of like this. So, so, so my wife will come home, and she'll be like, man, you know, I drove by BB's, and I saw they doing a, a crawfish sale. And I just don't even pay. I'm like, all right, cool. And then, you know, and, 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 and then we'll be driving in the car, and she'll be like, she just, she right next to me, and she's sending me DMs of, craw, of crawfish and crab boys. I'm like, hey, I, I just like thumbs the message up. 
And then she'll hit me back. She'll be like, man, you know, I just talked to so-and-so. You know that she's out there boiling crab. I'm like, baby, I get it. <laughs> but your frequency lets me know your importance on it. His frequency. Think about this. The most frequent miracle in the Bible is about vision. Or in the New Testament. Should they not tell us something that there's importance? What's up, BJ? That there's not importance on this. So I have a big idea because I really want to walk through this. Um, and our big idea encapsulates our three points for today. Usually I give the big idea at the beginning of the message, but I want to give here, here towards the middle or end because our three points are found, Jay Cook, in our big idea. And it's this. If you're taking notes, write this down. That we are a church and a people with heavenly, healthy, and huge vision. We are a church, and we are a people with heavenly, healthy, and huge vision. It is intentional. I talked about how God will give us a vision. I talked about how God cares about our vision. And it is important today that we discuss the duality in both of these and what it regards to us as a church and what it means to you and I as individual believers. But God cares about our vision, and we cannot take time and just sit back. And leave it unattended. I am concerned and I'm heartbroken because I feel that a lot of the problems that we see in our life or in some of our relationships, it's because we don't have vision for it. And if we have vision, it's not our first point. It's not heavenly. It's not heavenly. That God calls us to have heavenly vision. I want to show you this right here. The source of our vision it must come from God because Satan will try to compromise your vision. Somebody say compromise. So when we're talking about heavenly vision, that is talking about the source of our vision. In these three points, there are different, um, there are different characteristics, but the first one is we're talking about heavenly because it is the source of your vision. Let's go to the book of Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 says, again... The devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. He said, all this I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. What this is is that God, um, that Jesus is walking here, just got baptized, the sky cracked open, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove, and then a voice came from heaven and said, behold, this is my son of whom I'm well pleased. And it says, and after that, it said that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The devil didn't lead him out there. God led him out there. That's why every wilderness that you go into isn't just the devil because sometimes the spirit will lead you into that place. It says that the spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And on this 40th day, Jesus is hungry. Jesus is tired. Jesus is probably a little grumpy. I know I'll be if I didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. And it says, some of y'all said, Lord, please. But it says that Jesus comes to a place on his 40th day and that Satan comes to him and says, hey, turn, if you're really God, if you're really the son of God, turn this rock into bread. If, 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 if you're really the son of God, turn this rock into bread. Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. The second thing that he did, it says that he took him up to the temple and he told him, he said, or he took him up on a high cliff and he said, throw yourself off this. If you're really son of God, then the angels, that they'll come and they'll save you. And then he said, man, he said, don't tempt the Lord thy God. And then the last thing that we come to is this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. It says he takes him up to the temple above Oh, and he's overlooking all the kingdoms, and Satan tells him that, hey, I'll give you everything. Just worship me. Satan was trying to give Jesus a vision for, of his own. He was trying to say, hey, I can give you all of these things if you just do it my way. And I'm here to tell y'all, friends, that he still does the same thing. What if I told you, whoo. Our vision has to be rooted and our source has to be in God because if it's an ego or ambition, then you're wrong. Some of us want to build things not out, of, not out of obedience to God, but ambition of our own heart. That we want to create businesses just so we can say that we're richer than them. That we want to be in relationships just so we can post. The source of your vision is critical 
If it is not coming from God or from the word of God, then we have to check it. Because in the very first thing, hear me on this, we talked about this, that everything is built from the foundation. And if the source of your vision is wrong, everything after it will be contaminated. I know this sounds very simple, but it's important because I'm concerned that some of us are letting our vision be bred or led from our ego, from our ambition, from our heart and from our trauma and not from God. Our vision has to be heavenly. It has to come from the place of God. Because, well, that's why the Bible tells in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and then all the righteousness we add unto thee. What a lot of us like to do is that we want the righteousness and then we want to add God into it. The source of a thing needs to come from God. The second thing here is that we talked about, and this is where I want to spend the majority of my time, we talked about is heavenly. The second thing is healthy. Somebody say healthy. The second thing that our vision needs to be is healthy. So we talked about heavenly, which is the source of your vision. Now we're talking about healthy, which is the quality of your vision. There's a story in the book of Mark chapter 8 where Jesus heals a blind man. And when he heals this blind man, it says that when he came into the village, that a blind man was brought to him by some people in the city surrounding you. And he says that Jesus took his hand and led him out of the village and that when he looked at him... It said that he spit in his eyes and then asked him, what did he see? Now, if I could put a small parenthetical point right there. A lot of us would have never got the healing because we would not like the method. It said that Jesus spit in his eyes. Some of us be like, Jesus, I, man, listen, that healing journey is just a little too messy for me. We do the same thing. Want to be healed from that relationship, but not willing to go through the trauma and the process for it. Wanting to be healed from greed, but not wanting to go through the process of it. Some of us turn away the miracle because of the method. This man sat there. Jesus spat in his eyes. And he said, what do you see? Verse 24 is where he picked up. He said, he looked up and he said, I see people. And they look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. What is this? And this is also the only time we see in the Bible that Jesus had to double back. And if I tell you this right now, it's not because his, he didn't have the power to do it, but Jesus was trying to show us something in this moment. But listen to what he says. He says that he saw people walking as trees, and once more Jesus put his hands on a man's eyes. Because Jesus didn't only, he was not comfortable with just leaving him with the ability to see. He wanted to make sure that he saw clearly. So God does not just care that you have sight. He wants to know, can you see things clearly? Are you seeing yourself clearly? Are you seeing him clearly? Are you seeing church clearly? Are you seeing your belief system clearly? Because some of us are saying, oh, I'm see, I'm good. But you're walking around, half, walking around halfway whole. He's not okay with that. He doubled back. He put his hands on it. He said, hey, what do you see now? And his sight was restored. And he saw everything Clearly, I want to tell you this right here. God wants to make sure that, one, our vision is whole, and two, he knows that if, he can, if, that if the enemy can make us see things incorrectly, we'll treat things incorrectly. It is impossible to steward something or someone properly if you don't see them properly. Staying in cycles in our relationships simply because we can't see things the right way. What a shame that it is. Let's take a second to think about this man, that he was healed. Mm, I don't know if I want to go there. That, that he was healed. It says that he spat in his eyes. He said, I see people walking around and they look like trees. If he had been blind since birth, he would not know what a man looked like. So it means that he had vision at one time and then lost it. Some of us are in that place. The second thing is that he says, I see them walking around as trees. The thing that gets me there, JC, is because what a shame it is to be able to know what you're looking at and not be able to see it the right way. So that lets him know that there was a cognitive or that there was a distortion between what it is that he knew it was and what it is that he was able to interpret. How many of us sit in the same place? I'm looking at my mom, but I just can't see her the right way. I know that I'm looking at God, but I just can't see that he's loving. I know that I'm looking at the right church, but I just can't see it as trusting. I know that I'm looking at my finances, but I just can't look at it in the way that God is telling me to look at it. I have a distortion. I'm looking at myself. And I haven't been able to see myself. 
I see myself walking as a tree. I see myself walking as unlovable. I see myself walking as shameful. I see myself walking as a disgrace. I see myself walking as a failure. I know what I'm looking at. I just can't see it right. And God said, let me, let me touch you again. What if I told you today that God was wanting to touch your vision again? That for some of us, we're sitting in a place and we say, God, I see, but I don't see it all the way yet. God, my vision is not healthy. It's not interpreting things the right way. My vision is not clear. My vision, there's too many filters on it. I got too many opinions on it. That I'm looking through the lens of my trauma and I'm not looking through the, 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 the lens of health. That when I'm seeing things, I'm, I'm looking through the, through the lens of disappointment. I'm not looking through the lens of health. I'm telling you right now that God and biblical vision is heavenly and it is healthy and God is not okay with us being halfway there. The vision for our church, it has to be heavenly and healthy. It has to be rooted in building the kingdom and not building a man. It has to be rooted in saving souls and not just garnering attention. It has to be heavenly it has to be healthy. What areas of your life can you admit and say, man, Pastor Matt, I don't know if I'm seeing healthy in that area. I don't know. I feel like sometimes I'm looking at the Bible or sometimes I'm looking at my relationship with God and sometimes I just don't think that it's healthy. Godly vision has to be heavenly and God is calling us to be healthy. And the way that we create that healthy vision, hear me on this. Is by guarding our heart. Because some of us, if, let's throw Proverbs 4, 23. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do slows from it. That's not only your words, but that's your perspectives. And some of us can't see correctly because we let anybody, anything speak into us. Remember what we talked about, where there is no vision, the people what? Perish. That they're left unattended. And so therefore, if we're not guarding our heart, everything, it, it, it is the central system that if I'm letting all of this hurt, if I'm letting anybody speak into me, if I'm, letting any, if I'm watching any video, if I'm listening to any song, if I'm letting anybody disciple me, they're going to affect not only how I speak, but how I see. They're going to affect how it is that I think. They're going to affect how it is that I view everybody else because I allowed anything into my heart. You cannot correct your vision if you do not correct how you guard your heart. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Maybe if we took our eyes off of the wrong thing and put our eyes on Jesus, our vision would be more restored or would be restored. And the last thing is this. Our vision, we said that we have health, heavenly and then healthy. The last thing is that we have huge vision. Now, this is the thing that encouraged me. You might be saying, Pastor Matt, well, you're saying huge vision, but you just talked about earlier that we can't build things out of ambition, that we can't build things out of ambition or wanting things to be big. No, I told you that, you, that your vision has to be he heavenly. It does not have to be small. Our vision has to be heavenly. But if it's rooted in heavenly things, your vision will also be huge. Let me tell you something like this, because the size of your vision is going to be rooted in the size of your faith. The size of your God is going to determine the size of your vision. We should see things in our life being bigger. You should be able to see yourself out of depression. You should be able to see yourself out of anxiety. You should be able to see yourself into a new season. You should be able to see yourself into bigger places. Our vision has to be huge. The Bible tells us in Matthew 19, verse 26, it says that Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Jesus was restoring their perspective. Their vision was too small. That when you look at this thing, you see it is, it's impossible. That when you look at that situation in your life, when you look at your vision, when you look at what God has placed on, when you look at what God has called you to do, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know. If I'm able, I don't know if I'm capable. And God said that with man, with you, 
this thing is impossible. That if, it, that, that if it was just determined by you, if you were the only person that was making this thing happen, it would be impossible. But with God, it is impossible. And I'm here to tell you today, our vision has to get bigger. I tell you, the calling of our life, the calling on our life, the calling on our church, where God has called us to, it takes huge vision. I want this message today to be very simple and very practical. Because I do believe that we have a vision problem in the earth. I believe that in the body of Christ in specific, we have a vision problem. And the reason why I can say that is because I felt for a very long time I had a vision problem. Now we're sitting here, we're talking about it has to be huge just to tell you the story of our church as I close. Earlier this week, Pastor Donna and I, we got an opportunity to talk. And we begin to talk about how crazy it is that God has been doing what he's been doing in our church. A thousand people giving their life to Jesus and people talking about that, they, you know, B groups is four or five hundred people and all these things that are going, we're talking about numbers, but it's not the numbers, we're talking about impact and we're talking about transformation. But in the terms of a vision, I'll never forget, years ago, when God spoke this vision to my wife and I, our vision wasn't heavenly. Our vision wasn't healthy. And it definitely wasn't huge. The guy was speaking something to us, Suge, he was speaking something, and we said, there's no way that we can ever see anything like this ever happening. A church, lives, wrong person. Wrong person. You want to know why that I responded in that way? Because my vision, how I was seeing, my ability to see, it wasn't rooted in heavenly things. It was rooted in trauma. I think some of the things that God is speaking of your life, you're rejecting because of where it is that the source of your vision is. The second thing, when I saw what God was speaking, I said, I see a church and I see these things, but I cannot see it well. It looks like trees. It looks like dysfunction. When I looked at our marriage, when I looked at what I thought, it was not healthy. I said, there's no way. And then we got to the fruition, to the fruit, and my vision was small. I said, God, there's no way that you can use me. There's no way you can use us. There's no way you can use the six people that was on, that's on our lead team. There's no way that these things can happen. I had an unhealthy vision. And time went by, and God began to restore the source of my vision and made it heavenly. He began to restore the quality of my vision and made it healthy. And then somewhere along the way, he amplified the size of our vision and he made it huge. And his message today was simply for those of us that are going to be in this room. Because no matter what place in your vision that may be struggling, maybe you don't have a vision at all. Maybe you feel like your ability to see, remember we're talking about the duality, that God is here. And he's not only concerned for your, about your vision, but he has a plan for it. That the source of your vision can be restored to heavenly. That the health of your vision can be placed to where you see things clearly. And the size of your vision, I believe for all of us, God wants to increase. The Bible tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has entered the hearts of man the things that the Lord has for those who love him. I believe that God is not only going to restore your vision, but he's going to give you one that's bigger than you can ever imagine. And if you look at it from a heavenly standpoint, and you look at it healthy, you're going to look up years later and say, God, look what you've done again. God's vision for your life is huge. Can y'all just digest that for a second? 
from a heavenly standpoint. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The number one prerequisite to having a healthy, a heavenly, and a huge vision is it being rooted in Jesus Christ. If you're in this place today, and we're going to combine it, if you're in this place, and you've never given your life to Jesus, and you say, hey, today is the day. Today is the day that I root my vision in something healthy. Today is the day that I root my vision in something heavenly. Today is the day that I root my vision in something that's bigger than me. Or if you're in this place and you say, I've given my life to him before. But I walked away. I left my relationship unguarded. I left it to perish. But today I'm coming back on guard and I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. If you're one of those two people in this place today, I want you to lift your hand right where you are. Amen. I see the hands. I see the hands. Praise God. I see you all the way in the back. I see you. So this is what we're going to do. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're all going to pray this prayer together. And we're going to say it like we mean it. Everybody repeat after me. Say, Father, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. I believe that he lived, that he died, and that he rose from my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. I am yours, and you are mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Claire, give him a hand praise.